Right, so hello and welcome back to Books and Things and welcome to another video. And today I'm going to be telling you all about my favourite classics that I read in 2023. So every year I really look forward to making my favourite books of the year video where I talk about the books I have enjoyed the most reading in a year. Um, but this year I thought I would do this a little bit differently. Usually I just have one video where I rank my um, usually top 20 books of the year. But this year I have read a lot of books. Um, I think I've read more than I've ever read before this year. And a lot of them have been fantastic and especially I feel like I've had a very good year for classics where I've read a lot of great classics. So I thought this year I would split my favourite books of the year video into two and do a favourite classics of the year and a favourite modern books of the year. So today I am going to be doing my favourite classics of the year. So, so far this year, bearing in mind we have another week of the year to go, I'm filming this a little bit early because I know I'm not going to read any classics in the rest of the year, um, but at this point in the year I have read 165 things. Um, I think some of them, probably between five and ten of them, are like individual short stories rather than full length books, but I've read 165 things, um, 82 of which have been classics. So classics tend to make up about half of my reading and this year I have read some fantastic classics especially this Victober I had a very 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 successful Victober where I read a lot of wonderful things and I wanted to highlight all of the favorite things that I have read this year so we're gonna talk about 20 favorite classics and then we'll see how many modern favorites I do maybe there'll be 15 maybe there'll be 20 I've read a lot of fantastic modern books this year too but of my favorite 20 classics of the year I'm also going to break them down into categories by form I suppose um, because some of these are novels but I also have some plays and some non-fiction and things like that um, although before I get into any of those I do want to pull out my favourite classic reread of the year some years I do a separate um, favourite rereads of the year video sometimes I don't um, but I feel like this year there has been one complete standout in terms of my favourite reread and my favourite classic reread um, so I thought I would just mention it in this video because I don't think I need to do a separate rap ranking of my rereads this year. There is one book where the rereading experience has just been amazing and has completely changed my opinion of this book um, and that is Barnaby Rudge by Charles Dickens. So as you might know if you've been watching this channel for a little while over the last year and a bit I have been doing um, something called the Mega Dickens Read Along where we are reading Charles Dickens's novels in publication order from his first to his last and um, we are over halfway through um, we're up to Bleak House now and I have been really really enjoying rereading reading all of Dickens. Every Dickens reread has been really really fun um, but my reread of Barnaby Rudge was particularly special because while I had read Barnaby Rudge twice before I hadn't read it for um, something like eight years and I didn't remember it very well at all and it was almost like reading a new Dickens book like I'd forgotten so many things that it was almost like reading a new Dickens book for me um, and I just absolutely loved it. I thought Barnaby Rudge was incredible and I feel like the last time I read it I had found it a little bit slow or I hadn't really enjoyed it very much. Um, it had been a mediocre Dickens for me and then reading it this time I was just absolutely blown away by it, by how good it was, um, by how interesting it was, by how relevant and pertinent the theme has felt. And the audiobook I was listening to, which is narrated by Jason Watkins, um, really enriched the experience too so I'd really really recommend this audiobook. Barnaby Rudge is one of Dickens's historical novels, it's not set in the Victorian period, it's set in the late 18th century, um, part of it in 1775 and then we skip five years to 1780 and the book explores the Gordon riots which were anti-Catholic riots that took place in London in 1780 and we're following a lot of characters who get caught up in this riot and there are a lot of different subplots and I just think this book is incredible. I feel like the way this book looks at themes of class and prejudice and violence and intolerance um, is so powerfully done and the characterization in this book is fantastic. So this has definitely been my favourite classic reread of the year in terms of how much it has um, shot up in my estimation I suppose. I just was absolutely blown away by Barnaby Rudge this time so I highly recommend this one. Definitely worth a read, worth a listen actually. I feel like the audiobook is very very good um, and yeah I really enjoyed this this year. Next I want to tell you about my two favourite classic plays of the year. One of these is Charlie's Aunt by Brandon Thomas. This is a Victorian play which I read in Victober and I really really enjoyed. The setup of this play is that there are two young men um, and one of them, Charlie, his aunt is coming to stay and the fact that his aunt is coming to stay is a really good excuse for them to invite the two young ladies they love around for lunch um, because you know it would be inappropriate for the two young ladies to come without a chaperone but Charlie's aunt would be an excellent chaperone. They invite the young lady 
ladies to lunch, but then Charlie's aunt sends a telegram saying that she can't come. Um, but at that moment, one of their other friends at university um, is putting on his costume for an amateur dramatics production that he is going to be in later that day, where he is to play an elderly woman. Um, and when they see their friend dressed as an elderly woman, they say, ah, you're going to be Charlie's aunt. And everything goes on from there. I think I went into this play thinking that the humour would feel a little bit silly and a little bit dated, but actually it's very, very sharp and very witty. Um, and I feel like it's just really, really good fun. So Charlie's aunt was a massive hit for me this year. Great play um, and one I highly, highly recommend. And then a very different play that I absolutely loved this year was Gaslight by Patrick Hamilton from 1938. I'm not ranking my plays and short stories and stuff but I feel like if I were to rank this this would be one of my absolute favourite reads of the year. This is a fantastic fantastic play. So Gaslight was written in the 1930s but it's set in the Victorian period and it looks at the relationship between a husband and wife and I think the only other thing I want to tell you about Gaslight as a play is that this is the work of art from which the term gaslighting comes. It is very very dark but it is very very good. It's just a truly, truly fantastic play, really gripping, really fantastic dialogue, so well done. I loved reading it and I would love to see it sometime and it's just, just absolutely fantastic. Next, let me tell you about my two favourite classic short story collections of 2023. One was Under the Banyan Tree by R.K. Narayan. This is a 20th century Indian classic. I think it was first published as a collection in 1984, but the short stories within it were published in literary magazines kind of over decades of the author's life. And I just thought these short stories were really fantastic really really rich and interesting very very different as well I feel like it was one of those short story collections that kind of moved from very very moving and powerful and dark to very very funny between stories in a way that worked really really well like I just thought each individual story was fantastic but also the arrangement and the kind of like differing moods and tones of the short story collection were really really good so I definitely recommend that one a lot and then my other favorite short story collection of 2023 was Summer Lightning and Other Stories by Olive Senior this is a Jamaican classic from 1980 I just think the short stories in this collection were absolutely amazing. Um, so many of them were just so striking. I feel like Bright Thursdays, maybe like it would be in my like top five short stories ever. Like I just thought it was absolutely fantastic. So I highly, highly recommend Summer Lightning and Other Stories. And I definitely need to read more by Olive Senior at some point in the future. Then I also have two favourite non-fiction classics of 2023. Um, one is The Fire Next Time by James Baldwin, which I finally read this year and I thought was really, really incredible. Like it's one of those books that both simultaneously feels very, very relevant, but also like illustrates a particular point in time in a really, really interesting way. This is a very important book about racism and prejudice and fighting those things um, and it is just exceptionally written. It is in the form of two letters um, so first there is a short letter that James Baldwin wrote for his nephew and then there is what he calls letter from a region in my mind which is basically a kind of extended essay um, and they're both just fantastic. This is such a powerful striking book um, and I highly recommend it. One of those things I think everyone should read. And then another book I kind of think everyone should read is this. This is The Secret Diaries of Miss Anne Lister and this is my other favourite um, classic non-fiction of the year and something I absolutely loved reading this year. I'm holding up the first volume here. Um, I did read both volumes this year. I think both volumes are really really interesting but volume one I kind of probably got more out of I suppose um, but they're kind of both on this list together and this is standing in for both. Anne Lister, if you don't know, was an upper class woman living in the early 19th century in Britain um, and she wrote a lot of diaries throughout her life and half of her diaries were written in code, a code of her own devising and she wrote half her diaries in code in order to write about the more personal aspects of her life including her romantic and sexual relationships with women and I feel like Anne Lister's diaries are absolutely fascinating reading and kind of reading that anyone who has any interest in history in any way should read. Like I feel like the insights her diaries give you into the history of sexuality, of class and the kind of position of women in general, it's so vivid and rich and also you do get to know Anne as a person by reading these diaries in a way that you very rarely get from reading any other historical diaries because she wrote them in code and she was so personal. Like I just think this is an absolutely fantastic read and the first volume of her diaries, I know my own heart, like it basically Basically, it's almost like reading a coming of age story, except it is someone's real life. Um, so I highly, highly recommend Anne Lister's Diaries for everyone. Um, they're fantastic. I'm not certain um, whether it's quite right to put this in my favourite classics of the year video because um, obviously these diaries were written in the early 19th century, but um, Anne Lister did not publish them herself and they weren't published for a very, very long time afterwards. And also I feel like Helena Whitbread, who edited the diaries, um, 
selected the most interesting passages and adds a lot of context into this book um, and this book would not be so interesting without that you know Helena Whitbread and um, deserves a lot of credit as well as Anne Lister but I just think this is absolutely fantastic and anyone who has like the faintest bit of interest in 19th century history like this is absolutely a must read but now we are on to the novels I have 13 favorite classic novels of 2023 which I'm going to rank for you they are of course mostly Victorian because what else would you expect from my channel I loved all of these books so much and it has been a fantastic year for great classics and especially for great Victorian literature so let's start off at number 13 with a wonderful work of Victorian fiction and that is Night and Morning by Edward Bulwer Lytton from 1841. I read this in October and I really enjoyed it. It was my first Edward Bulwer Lytton and I thought it was great. It tells a story of um, two young siblings and what happens when after their father's death they are assumed to be illegitimate. They're not illegitimate, their parents were married but their parents had a private secret marriage um, and the paperwork has been lost and so everyone presumes they are illegitimate. The young man is not able to inherit the property he's meant to um, and he struggles to kind of provide for his younger brother and his mother. We follow the life of this young man Philip, his efforts to make a life for himself um, and also at times to get revenge on the people who have wronged him. This book to me feels a little bit like um, David Copperfield and Oliver Twist like smushed together with the Count of Monte Cristo in a really really fantastic way um, and I just thought it was great. There's also some really interesting characterization in here um, and I just thought it was a really great read so I highly highly recommend Night and Morning. As I'm talking about it I feel like it probably should be a few places higher up this list but oh well we will live with the ranking. It's pretty vague anyway. At number 12 I have My Flirtations by Ella Hepworth Dixon, a short Victorian novel from 1892. This is a very short, light, funny, episodical book which is basically just our narrator um recounting the 13 different men that she has flirted with and how those particular flirtations ended it's very light and entertaining but it also consists within it a lot of kind of like wry social commentary and sort of like um casual laughing at the ridiculousness of 19th century courtship rituals um, which I really really enjoyed. The main character also has an elder sister Christina who is very entertaining um, and while the narrator is going off and flirting with everyone her sister is just like sat in the corner having no interest in men whatsoever and sort of laughing at everything that's going on and that dynamic is really really fun. My Flirtations is a very quick read and um, like Night and Morning I read it in Victober and I think my flirtations probably only took me two hours to read. It's very good fun though and I would highly recommend it. At number 11 I have A Burglary by Amy Dillwyn, a Victorian novel from 1883. Amy Dillwyn is fast becoming one of my favourite Victorian writers. I really really enjoy her writing style and her insightful interesting characterization. A Burglary follows um, the fallout of a burglary as you might guess from the title um, and basically what happens in this novel is that there is a family um, living in Wales, man of the house, two children, their cousin who's an heiress has come to stay um, and the cousin is robbed one night there is a burglary and the cousin's jewels are stolen and everything kind of goes on from there we follow the characters who are affected by the burglary and we also follow the burglar themselves this book is so interesting in so many ways I loved the characterization I loved the dramatic sequences of this book the burglary itself but also there's something else very dramatic that happens at the end of the novel that is so exciting and so well done um, but also the kind of psychology of the characters and especially of the burglar character um, it's just fantastic so I highly recommend The Burglary. Amy Dillwyn is a wonderful wonderful writer and this was a fantastic read. Another Victober success for 2023. I feel like so many of my 2023 favourites are Victober picks which is always very exciting to know. But it's not all about the Victorians um, and at number 12 I have this. This is The Beautiful Summer by Cesare Pavese um, translated from the Italian by W.J. Strachan um, and this was a really really fantastic book that I really loved. This is basically a coming of age story of a 16 year old girl girl um, who is growing up in 1930s Italy and I just thought this was so beautifully written and the characterization was so interesting. It's interesting when I read the blurb of this book before I read it and um, the blurb says that the focus of the book is kind of this relationship she has with a young male artist in the neighborhood but for me the main focus of this book was the friendship, the quite romantic friendship she has with another young woman who is an artist model and the relationship between them and the really interesting dynamic between them was definitely my favorite thing in the book and I thought was done so well 
I just found this a really, really interesting novel with a lot packed into a short space, so another one I definitely recommend. Then at number nine, we are back to the Victorians with Nina Babakar by Anthony Trollope, which was published um, in 1867. And this is a slightly different novel for Anthony Trollope because it's not set in the UK, it's set in Prague, and it basically looks at the tensions and social prejudices between Christian and Jewish communities in Prague in the 19th century, specifically focusing on Nina Balakar, who is a young Christian woman who is engaged to a young Jewish man. And this book basically focuses on the course of their engagement and the disapproval of their engagement from their families and the communities around them. And I just thought Nina Balakar was a fantastic novel with really, really good characters and really, really interesting themes. It is very much a book that is about and very critical of anti-Semitism. Even though the book is set in Prague, I do feel like he was purposely criticising attitudes in Britain as well. And I feel like it's a very fantastic book um, and a slightly different one for Anthony Trollope. So I definitely recommend Nina Balakar. Um, it was a really good read. At number eight, I have Untouchable by Milk Rush Anand. This is a Indian classic from the 1930s and this was fantastic. This is a short powerful book that looks at one day in the life of a young man who is an untouchable within India's caste system and this book basically follows him over the course of the day, the way that people treat him, the prejudice he faces, the difficulties of his social position and it is a book that is full of social criticism, full of interesting observations and interesting characters and it's just really really well done and very very powerful um, and like again a bit like The Beautiful Summer it packs a lot into a short book so I highly highly recommend Untouchable. I thought it was really really fantastic, um, just a really great book and one I definitely definitely recommend. And number seven I have Cars on the Table by Agatha Christie. This is a British book from 1936. Agatha Christie Christie is an author who I really really love and I have read quite a lot by her this year but um, Cards on the Table was definitely my favourite. This is a really really fun Poirot novel where um, a man that Poirot knows um, who thinks that he's good at collecting interesting people has a dinner party and to this dinner party he invites four people who he believes have at some point in their lives committed a murder and four people who are in some way sleuths. So we have Hercule Poirot of course, we have Superintendent Battle who is a wonderful character who features in a few other Agatha Christie novels so it's really fun to see him. There is another character who I have encountered in a previous Agatha Christie novel, The Man in the Brown Suit, but I feel like maybe it's a slight spoiler for The Man in the Brown Suit to say his name so I won't. Um, and then there is a new character who I hadn't encountered before in Poirot called Ariadne Oliver, who is a crime writer. Anyway, at this dinner party, the man who has hosted the dinner party is, of course, murdered. And then the fourth sleuths have to try and work out which of the four murderers might have killed this man. It's just a really fun Agatha Christie. The solution and the mystery is great, um, but also this idea of having like four sleuths um, and four murderers and can they work out who it might have been is just really, really fun. So I highly recommend Cards on the Table. I do think I found it extra fun because I have read quite a few other Agatha Christie books and, you know, I recognise Superintendent Battle and the other character and I could see that in Ariadne Oliver she was kind of like taking the mick out of herself in quite a fun way. Um, but yeah, I just really, really loved Cards on the Table. It was great. So we're now into my top six classics of 2023, all of which I loved, all of which were Victorian. No surprises there. I think all of these books are absolutely fantastic and I feel like if I had written this list on a different day, any of these six might have ended up at the top and these six might be in a completely different order. But these six are just fantastic, so let me get into them. At number six for now, we have A Man and Wife by Wilkie Collins from 1870. This is a fantastic, fantastic, dramatic Wilkie Collins book that is so exciting, so pacey, with such amazing characterization. Wilkie Collins is a very hit and miss author for me, but Man and Wife is absolutely a hit. It was fantastic. I think probably the best Wilkie Collins book I've read in terms of plot. I might love the Moonstone more because I love the different narrators in it, but I kind of think Man and Wife is probably the better book. Man and Wife, after a rather tangential prologue, focuses on two young women. One of them, at the very beginning of the novel, has met a young man who she's in love with, they're going to get engaged, everything's looking happy and cheerful for her, and meanwhile for her friend, um, who is a bit older than her, things are not going so very well, and she has got involved outside of marriage with a young man who she is now trying to persuade to marry her. Um, and will he marry 
her or not and everything from that point onwards gets completely crazy. The plot of Man and Wife is amazing. It all centers around the complexities of Scottish marriage law but it's also like exceptionally pacey and the drama and the tension and the violence of this book is truly amazing. I feel like Wilkie Collins has never created a better character than Geoffrey Delamain. Like I feel like Geoffrey Delamain as a character is just marvellously done, like superbly created. And there was just so much in Man and Wife that I loved. I feel like the characterization and the drama was just fantastic. Um, and I just highly, highly recommend it. At number five, we have another Anthony Trollope book, um, not even the last Anthony Trollope book in this favourites video. And that is An Eye for an Eye from 1879. And this was a fantastic, dramatic, again, slightly different Anthony Trollope book. An Eye for an Eye has the kind of setup that you expect from an Anthony Trollope book if you've read quite a few of his books. We have a young man who, after the death of his cousin, finds himself due to inherit an estate from an uncle he doesn't know very well. Now that he is due to inherit this estate, his uncle asks him to leave the army and come and live with him. Um, and the uncle and his wife um, have a good idea of the kind of young lady that they would like their heir to marry. Um, but he says, no, I would like to spend one more year in the army. So he goes off with his regiment. They go to Ireland. And in Ireland, he has met a young woman um, who he rather likes and we have this kind of question set up quite early on is the young man going to follow his heart or is he going to follow the wishes of his family and that is a fairly conventional Anthony Trollope setup but in an eye for an eye we also have this title an eye for an eye that hints at like revenge we also have a prologue in which we know that one of the characters featuring in this novel is going to end up in an asylum and we don't know why and everything kind of goes on from there and an eye for an eye is very very good it has a fantastic interesting plot with such great tension really really good characterization um and the ending is just wonderful and an eye for an eye does that thing that Anthony Trollope often does so well where he has a young man who is flawed and you don't know for quite a while in the book whether he's going to be irredeemable or redeemable and you're kind of waiting to see which way this flawed young man is going to go um and it's just fantastic so i highly highly recommend it eye for an eye it was wonderful Anthony trollope is wonderful at number four i have the best book by sarah graham this is a new woman novel from 1897 um, and this was a truly fantastic read the best book follows the character of beth from her childhood into her adulthood um and we basically follow beth's experience Experience being a girl and a woman in the Victorian period and the problems of being a woman within the Victorian social world in terms of getting an education and um, problems within marriage and so much more. There was so much I loved in the Beth book. I feel like its feminist themes are really really fantastically done and also the coming of age element in it is fantastic. We watched Beth grow up from her childhood and about half the book is Beth's childhood and you really see her becoming a person in a wonderful wonderful way. Like I feel like it's one of the best coming of age stories I've read in terms of how much you see Beth becoming a person and how much you follow the growth of her mind and I just loved it like the Beth book is just fantastic it's quite a long book but it's really 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 worth it a really standout novel one of my favorite pieces of new women fiction um and just a truly wonderful read so I highly highly recommend the Beth book what a fantastic fantastic book at number three I have another new woman novel um, and this is A Struggle for Fame by Charlotte Riddell from 1883 um, and this was a fantastic, fantastic Victorian book that I just loved. So this book follows a couple of different characters, a young woman and her father and a young man who move from Ireland to London at the beginning of the novel. The young lady, Glenn, wants to be a novelist and unknown to her, the young man who came across with them also wants to be a writer. And this book basically looks at the publishing industry in the mid-Victorian period, the difficulties of becoming a writer, the difficulties especially of becoming a female writer at this time. And it basically picks apart the publishing industry and the lives of writers and editors in the mid-Victorian period in such a wonderful, wonderful way. Charlotte Riddell is a fantastic writer and her characterization is wonderful and her characterization is also really, really complex. I feel like actually, now that I'm thinking about it, I feel like what Charlotte Riddell really makes me think of is like a more feminist Anthony Trollope, which is someone who adores Anthony Trollope and very occasionally would like him to be more feminist. And um, that is something I'm very excited for and I definitely need to read more by Charlotte Riddell. This was fantastic. I love the way this looked at the publishing industry and kind of the lives of writers and editors. Obviously, I feel like as someone who is both an author and an editor, that was like especially exciting for me. But even if you're not really excited by those themes, this book is a wonderful, wonderful read. And yeah, I just love this so much. Highly, highly recommend it. And number 
too because it's wonderful to have lots of exciting Victorian new women fiction in a row. I have Gloriana or the Revolution of 1900 by Florence Dixie from 1892. This is another late Victorian feminist book, um, a work of new woman fiction. As you may have noticed, it is from 1892, but it is called The Revolution of 1900. And basically it is a novel that is set in the near future from when it was written about a feminist revolution. Um, and it is fantastic. And what I love about Gloriana or The Revolution of 1900 is that I feel like a book about a feminist revolution could have been a bit manifesto-y, but instead it is basically a sensation novel. It is a sensation novel about a feminist revolution. There are murders, there are betrayals, there are disguises. And basically the book starts with a young girl and her mother walking along the beach. I think Gloriana at this point is about 12 years old and she says to her mother, I want to fix gender equality. I want to put women in the position that they ought to be in. I'm going to do it. And Gloriana or the Revolution of 1900 is about how she does just that. And it is great. It is so good. It's so exciting and so dramatic and so fun and so feminist. And I loved it so much. I just think Gloriana is a fantastic, fantastic novel that is so feminist and so fun and just brought me like such excitement and such joy and yeah i just loved it a lot and i highly 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 recommend it maybe it should be number one on this list not number two but anyway at number one i have put ralph the air by anthony trollope to be honest i won't lie i finished this this morning and it was fantastic but if i had finished it three weeks ago maybe it would be like number two or number three but right now i'm just filled with love for this book because it was so wonderful gloriana has stayed with me since april and i still think it was truly fantastic but ralph the air was also so good so maybe these are my joint favorites of the year i don't know but anyway let me tell you about ralph the air ralph the air is an anthony trollope novel from 1871 I love Anthony Trollope a lot. There are three books by him on this list. I feel like generally every Anthony Trollope novel I read is just a joy in every way. And this book was fantastic. So Ralph the Air follows a few different characters. We have a lawyer who lives with his two daughters, Clarissa and Patience, um, and they are about to welcome into their home their cousin Mary, who they don't know. She spent her life living abroad, but she's coming to live with them now. And then we also have a few young men who are important in this novel, two of which are called Ralph Newton just, you know, for extra confusion. So we have Ralph Newton, who is the heir, Ralph the heir, who is the heir to a particular property. Um, and he has been um, the ward of the lawyer, so he knows all the young women at the house quite well. Um, and he has a cousin who is also called Ralph Newton, who is not the heir because he is the illegitimate son of the present owner of this property. He's not the heir because he is illegitimate, but he is in many ways a better man than Ralph, who is the heir. Ralph the illegitimate, lives with his father, Mr. Newton, the squire of Newton. Um, and he also is good friends with Gregory Newton, the um, vicar of Newton, who is the brother of Ralph Newton. Yes, there are four Mr. Newtons and a place called Newton in this book. It is slightly mad in a glorious way. This book basically looks at the complicated relationships between all of these people, the love stories, the friendships, the money troubles, um, and much, much more. Ralph the heir is one of those flawed young men that Anthony Trollope writes so well um, where you just don't know if he's going to be redeemably flawed or irredeemably flawed and you're going to have to wait and find out and that's so fun. I love this book so much. It was just an utter joy to read. The characterization was wonderful. There were so many characters I loved in this. I think especially the squire of Newton, the old man, I really, really enjoyed. I don't know what it is about grumpy old squires, um, but I feel like there were a lot of Victorian novels in which my favourite character is the grumpy old squire. I just really enjoy that kind of figure in Victorian literature. I also think Ralph the illegitimate as opposed to Ralph the heir was a wonderful character who I really really loved one of my new favorite characters in Trollope all the subplots were great like there was just so much in this novel that I really really enjoyed and I thought it was really really fun there was also like something that happened in the middle of the novel where I realized it was going to happen about like five pages before it did and it was like so tense and so good and just fantastically done and in general this book was just such a joy like I was just sat on the edge of my seat enjoying the ride hugely and it was just an utter delight and I will just say, the reason why I have ended up putting this as my number one of the year, rather than Gloriana um, or any of the other amazing Victorian books I read this year, um, was because there was a moment when I was reading Ralph the Air where I was enjoying it so much, where I had a moment's thought in my mind, which was, what if Anthony Trollope is my favourite author, not Charles Dickens? And then I went on listening to Bleak House, which I'm rereading at the moment, um, and reminded myself that I absolutely adore Dickens, and Dickens is my favourite author. But there was a moment while I was reading Ralph the Air where I was like, Anthony Trollope is just the utter best. 
I also do feel like there is a difference between an author who is your favourite, where you've read everything by them, and an author who is your favourite, where you still have more books to go. You know, I have read all of Charles Dickens's novels by now, um, so when I reread a Dickens novel, it gives me huge joy, and it gives me a sort of nostalgia and um, fondness that I don't necessarily have when I read an Anthony Trollope novel, but I can never quite have the same reading that book for the first time feeling. Whereas because Trollope wrote so many books, I still have that excitement of reading something for the first time feeling when I'm reading a new Trollope book. I have now read 34 novels by Anthony Trollope out of his 47. And I have loved nearly all of those 34 so much. And Anthony Trollope is just such a joy to read. And I'm just, I'm just really excited to read like the last 13 novels by him. Even though I have said that I, I love that kind of new excitement of reading a new book by one of your favorite authors. I wish Dickens had written 47 novels. I would have read them all, but you know, 14 novels is pretty good. Um, I love Dickens very much. Don't worry, Dickens is still my favorite author, but I just had that like momentary moment where I was like, you know what? I love Anthony Trollope so much, like almost as much as Dickens. And it was Ralph the Air that made me think that. So I guess that means my favourite classic of 2023 is Ralph the Air. So there we have it. Those are my favourite classic books that I have read in 2023. I feel like I've been filming for a really long time so I'm sorry if this video was very long but this is why I have split my favourite contemporary and classics video into two this year um, because I have so many books that I love this year that were amazing. Please do let me know down in the comments what was your favourite classic that you read in 2023. That's all for now. Thanks so much for watching and I'll be back very soon with another bookish video.